Good morning. Good to have a few minutes together today as we end the week. And we had a great uh, Wednesday night, a great crowd, kids class. Little by little, our ministries are opening up. And, and uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about news because you probably watch the news. We're going to be in Isaiah 59. Wednesday night, my Bible study was on two verses in Isaiah 59 and then a couple of others. But I'm going to go back and fill in around it. And if you weren't there Wednesday night, it uh, might be worth going online and watching it. It's be on our YouTube channel. I'm ready to kind of build around this um, this thought of why um, why some of the f- folks are in a mess like they're in. Um, speaking of messes, I brought a copy of this up, uh, a book I wrote this last year, Surviving the Tsunami. And um, it's just it's short devotions, like, oh, two, three pages long. You know, here's just... Um, don't expect religious people to act like Christians. It's a random chapter. And uh, just four or five pages. This would be maybe a devotional to read. Just a, a little page, a, cup, a chapter here, a chapter there. Just thoughts on how to hang in there when the waves of pressure are on you. And they will be. You know, there's no great Christian that's not been tested. Uh, no great Christian in the Bible, nor great Christian in our world. If you're not being tested and tried by God, then God's not interested in you. You're either a fruitless Christian, he's set on the shelf, and um, and there's, you're of no value to God, or you're not saved. And uh, so if you're a child of God, and you're trying to serve him and honor him with your life, you're going to be tested, because God wants to improve and better you and those kind of things. And so um, this might be a help to you. I would not, I don't ever want anything like that, to, or this that we're doing now, these Bible lessons. Don't let this replace your Bible reading. Um, read your Bible, spend time in it, think about it. But perhaps these are thoughts that will be a help to you. And we have some of these at church. When I think of it, I bring some to the service. You can, they're a, it's a, the, the publisher's selling them for, I think, $15. But I got a box of them for $10 um, that we're selling for $10. So anyway, they'll be in there some in our bookstore. And if you're not, if you don't go to our church, don't live in our area and you like one, uh, we'll pay the shipping, we'll mail you one and be happy to do that. So Isaiah 59 let me just look at a couple of things with you. Now, I've talked about this before. Repetition is a key. When you see a word or similar words repeated together over and over, mercy and truth go together. And you find all the verses, mercy and truth, repeat uh, themselves together, and they'll give you some truths. Um, a couple of words you can look at in Isaiah 59. Lies. If you want to look there at verse 3, uh, your lips have spoken lies in the middle of the verse. And then verse 4, uh, and speak lies. And then... Um, go down to verse 13 in transgression and lying and so this this matter of honesty is an issue because another word you see repeated over and over is the word truth and and I blur judgment judgment and truth and justice all together let me just give you an example look at verse 4 none call for justice verse 8 the way of peace have they not known there is no judgment uh, verse 9, therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. Uh, verse nine, uh, verse 11, we roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but is far from us. Verse 14, judgment is turned away backward, justice standeth far off, for truth is fallen in the streets, yea, truth faileth. Um, and there's more like that. Now, a couple of thoughts, just about where we are in our culture. Uh, a couple of mornings ago, I uh, gave three points of why we have trouble in the streets. And this is going to add to it. But I want you to notice some of the cries of, of, of people. Uh, if you want to look at verse 9. Therefore, judgment is far from us. Neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity for brightness. But we walk in darkness. So this is talking this is talking about the Jewish people, and I would say during the church age, from the time of Christ till the rapture, um, there's an awful lot of injustice. Uh, and so the literal doctrinal application, this is to the Jewish people, uh, these verses go down, going down to verse 20, verse 19, um, um, the, uh, they're having to do with the Jews in our era. Then uh, it comes to the Lord's second coming in the millennial reign of Christ, and it changes where God steps in and saves and puts his word in their hearts. But um, but if you look there at verse where I just read a moment ago, 
In verse 9, judgment is far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. Um, when, when the people cry out, we've seen no justice, and we've, we've seen no, nobody's fair, and nobody's just, and it's my child in the school who feels they're being picked on, it's a, 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 a racial group, it's a country, you know, it could be a Bangladesh or a Chad or whatever, and so these countries change, I don't think there's a Chad anymore, but these countries change names, but um, the, the, the crowds uh, occupying Wall Street and these groups of people crying out and, you know, the hippies in the 60s crying out for social justice and, and fighting against big business and all that stuff. Well, in verse 9, he says that you've been crying out, judgment's far and justice doesn't overtake you. You're looking for light and you don't find it. You're looking for brightness and you don't find it. In verse 10, we grope in for a wall like blind and, and grope as if we had no eyes. They stumble. At, these people are stumbling through life. We're surrounded here. Um, homes, jobs, cars. Some people have more money than others. Some have better jobs than others. But we, we've got food. We've got clothing. And uh, you say, well, you're, you're privileged. No, I'm not privileged. We grew up poor, holes in my shoes, holes in the knees in my jeans, and pants always too short because I was growing. And and um, and I did have, you know, a split home, single mother for a while, step parents. Um, they, our country is so filled with people who are working and paying the bills. How do you think the government has all the money they have to spend? They take it from the working people. And um, why why is Israel? Why would why the Holocaust? Why? The, the Turkish, the Ottoman Empire, they call it, the Turkish occupation of Israel, and why over and over Jerusalem was leveled to the ground, and why the Jewish peoples, they're so small, they're one-tenth of one percent of the world population. Why do why are they so hated, and yet why are there more percentage-wise Jew, Jewish millionaires than any other race or religion on earth? Um, but why all the anger? Well, the injustice in verse 9 Judgment and justice is far. Look at the verse, first word in verse 9. Therefore, all right, therefore, why? Why do they not have justice and judgment? So let's go back a little bit. Verse 8, the way of peace they have not known. There's no judgment in their goings. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. They chose to be crooked. They chose a crooked path. And I don't care if it's an eight-year-old or an 18-year-old, when they start choosing, and if you talk to a teacher, you talk to someone that works with children in schools, there are kids who begin to choose. And uh, some might say, well, they had a rough upbringing. Ah, uh, they may have, they may not. But once they start choosing a path, they're not going to find peace. They choose a path of corruption. Go back, see, this is God's word. God is not politically correct. You've probably noticed that. Look back at verse 7. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting, and destruction are in their path. Now, the rioting going on right now up in Seattle and other places around the country, they run to evil, they shed blood, iniquity, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting, and destruction are in their path. These are people who wherever they go, they destroy things. They burn cars, they burn buildings, throw in rocks and baseball bats through businesses. And those businesses didn't do anything wrong. Uh, they just happened to be there. And uh, and uh, the, the violence, the tearing things up and um, taking over things, violence and destruction. You see, this crowd of people, they've chosen to be violent. They've chosen to be angry. And um, you go back a verse... Um, back up to verse 1 and 2. The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is the ear heavy that he cannot hear. God says, I can save you. I'm very capable of saving you. But verse 2, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Now, this is specifically to the Jewish nation, but it's applicable to any culture in any society. And your sins separate, God says, your, you Jewish people, your sins have separated you from me. Your iniquities, my hand, I could reach out and save you just like that. But your, your sinfulness, and he, he talks about there, um, look at verse 4. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for the truth. For truth, There's a, a culture that Jewish people are in, and we are in America today. Nobody's crying out for truth. Nobody's begging for truth. We're, I mentioned this on Wednesday night. But we are people standing up and fussing for 
emotions and for social opinions, you know, public opinion. Um, if enough Twitter followers or social media followers are for me, it's okay. If I get pressure from social media, I change. I'm not worried about truth. I'm worried about being accepted in the digital following. I'm not worried about God being pleased with me. I'm worried about what people, and that's the kind of thing uh, that we're doing in America. It's the thing they were doing in the Jews' day. They weren't crying out for justice and truth. They were lying. And um, we have a culture right now, many, many, and it's not just right now. I think it was back in the 60s. I don't remember before that, but I know in the 60s, we had a culture, I think, where people did made their decisions on the basis of feelings. Young people need to be so guarded. And parents, it's our job to teach our young people. Uh, Sunday night, I'm going to be talking about this in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 1. But young people have got to be taught, your feelings are untrustworthy. And your feelings will get you going to these riots and rallies and picketing to save the whales and, and burning down buildings because of injustice. Tell me what injustice is worse than burning down a stranger's building, a stranger who's done you no wrong. And uh, that's unjust beyond, beyond words. And yes, we have corrupt government. We have corrupt people. Wherever there's people, there's corruption. But hurting an innocent neighbor is not the solution to any of that stuff. And so um, the problem in verse 4, when we stop crying out for justice and when we stop crying out for the truth, not just justice like I feel, but the truth. And that's where we were talking about on Wednesday night. If you weren't there, just as a review, um, you look over to verse 13, in transgression and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt. Is that not a riot? Is that not our Occupy this neighborhood? That They're speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And, and the culture of of uh, over of oppressing, oppressing people, scaring people. We have coaches afraid to cut people from a team. We've got businesses afraid uh, to uh, operate their business. We've got people all over in business who they're not worried about the health of anybody. They're worried about lawsuits and the oppression. What if someone writes something bad about us on Yelp for a Yelp review? And we're so concerned. And see, we're a society that's beginning to oppress one another. You know, I don't care what the business is. They've had a bad day. I don't care who the waitress is. She's had a bad day. I don't care what the line of, of whether it be a Chinese buffet or a Ruth's Chris. There's been an unhappy customer, and it might have been all the customer's fault that day. But we, we, we have a, a culture where we're afraid of somebody writing a review, a negative review about us. Man, when we stop worrying about truth and we start panicking over the oppressive culture... And when we start jumping on and trying to oppress, what have we watched with our president the last three years? People trying to oppress him and get him discouraged. And I don't know how the guy keeps on because at some point you think, who cares? Have your old country. I'm rich. I'm old. Who cares? But he does care. And he has stood up for what he believes to be right. Now, I'm not saying uh, any of our presidents are ever hitting it right all the time, but this guy's hitting it right an awful lot. Um, and so... Uh, you look at this story here, justice and judgment are repeated over and over. Lying and, 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 uh, and uh, lies is repeated over and over and over. But you know, the thing that's sad in all this is verse 8, where he says, The way of peace they know not. And the end of that verse, Therein shall not know peace. The saddest thing is, is God is the author of peace. And God is the author of rest for the soul and all the anger and all the blaming and all the finger pointing and all of the, the, the violence. If they get what they want, they won't have peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And that's why we've got to have Sunday school. And that's why we've got to stop our Sunday sports and get our families into church. I don't mean you can't play ball on Sunday. That's between you and, and your schedule. But we need... Not, not using church sports as replace it. We have guys play ball here on Sunday afternoon, but but we need to be in church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We ought to be reading our Bible daily. We ought to be taking time to draw near to God because peace doesn't come from money, obviously, from all the crazies around. Um, the rich people are just absolutely nuts. Uh, can't keep their spouse, can't keep their kids, can't stay off drugs, can't control their world of finance. They're a mess. See, peace... Peace comes when you follow the path of truth. 
And Jesus said his word is truth. And this culture of anger and rioting and violence and oppression, it's all through. I won't go through every verse, but it's all through Isaiah 59. And because of that, God withdraws. And I'll, I'll close with this. If you look at verse where I was on Wednesday night, verse 14, judgment is turned away backwards. See, judgment tries to get into your world. And uh, because we lie, because we don't seek the truth, because we're not longing for God and truth, judgment just, verse 14, turns away backwards. Judgment says, I can't get in there. We can't have judge. We're not treated, treated right by our culture. I mean, our un, you see, it's an unjust world. We'll start seeking God and start seeking truth and quit lying. There are people who lie on purpose because their lie is okay if it justifies the end, justifies the means. He says the, later in verse 14, and justice standeth afar off. And justice, people that are crying out for justice, justice tries to get into our world and then it stands way far off. Why? Because the next phrase in verse 14, for, for truth is fallen in the streets and nobody cares. Nobody cares about truth. We lie about, we lie to get money. People, there's rioters going in and walking into stores and robbing and stealing, lying, deceiving people. And a culture that allows people to burn and to rob and to blame that culture can't find peace, and they're not going to find justice, and they're not going to find judgment. And boy, I tell you what, Jesus is the answer. I like what Dr. House, uh, it was so funny, he told this story at youth conference. A couple of thousand teenagers there, and the teenagers, he had these teenagers, they were so shocked. He said he went into the stall in a men's room, and he looked in the wall of the, 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 the stall there where the commode was, and it, somebody had written in a felt pen, Jesus is the answer. And then someone else, another pen came along and said, what's the question? And Dr. Howes said that bothered him and bothered him and bothered him. And finally, he took out a felt pen and wrote, it doesn't matter what question it is. Jesus answers all the questions. And the kids were rolling on the floor laughing. And that Dr. Howes would write on the bathroom wall. But you know what? Jesus is the answer. He's the answer to every question. And this book, it's the answer to every question. And the problems of America could be solved. Right there, an old 1611 black back book. Read it, love it. Hey, let's pray for a good weekend and ask for God's blessing on us, all right? God bless you. Have a good day, and let's, we'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday.